In this video, we'll talk about how to use Firebase Remote Config in Flutter. Hey guys, and welcome back to episode 10 of the Firebase and Flutter series. Today, we will be covering Remote Config and its integration into Flutter. The first thing I want to cover is what Remote Config does not do, since I think there's some misunderstanding about its functionality and its purpose. The first thing to know is that Remote Config is not a real-time solution. The most important feature and functionality that Remote Configs provide is for things like A-B testing, conditional rollouts and partial feature releases. Those are the most important things that this functionality provides and if it's not important to you at this moment, there are better solutions for real-time configuration like the real-time database. So what Remote Config does is allow you to provide certain values based on an axis of conditions. You would be able to provide a certain value of a key value mapping specifically to a certain language that's on a certain platform and that shows at a certain time of the day. So if you have any kind of conditional logic for configuring your applications, whether it be for localization or for area specific promotional images, then Remote Config is definitely for you. Let's briefly go over how it is used and some terminology that you'll have to understand when we continue with the rest of this tutorial. The first thing you always have to do when starting with Remote Config is apply default values. Default values will be used in case the app can't connect to your server or times out while connecting to your server. The first major term used in remote config is fetch values. This sounds pretty straightforward, but there's actually a little bit of extra details that you'll have to know to understand the remote config usage better. Fetch values does exactly what it implies and it fetches the values from the remote config server. It is not as straightforward as it seems because if the cache hasn't expired, the same values that have been fetched previously will be returned to you. The default cache expiration time is set to 12 hours. This means that when a user starts your app at 1pm and you change your remote values at 2pm, if they start the app up again, they'll still get the values that they got from the first request that they made. You can set your expiration to 0 seconds and that will make sure that it fetches the remote config from the server whenever it's requested. The problem with using a zero duration expiration is that the remote config is not meant to be a real-time solution. Therefore, you can run into throttling issues from the client and from the remote server. The second set of terminology is apply the fetched values. So this function does exactly as it says and the reason it works the way it does is because the fetch values doesn't actually apply the values. It stores it next to the current remote config values so that you can apply it whenever you are ready. So because the Firebase team separated these two actions, there are multiple ways that you can implement your remote config flow. The first one is fetch then activate and then update. This is when you launch your application, you fetch the new values and in the completion handle of the fetch, you apply those values and send the notification to the UI to rebuild. The downfall of this is that your user's UI will change while they are using the app. But the one benefit is that it all runs in the background, so there's no waiting time for the user. The second option, which is what we will be doing, is to show a loading indicator at the start of the app, fetch your values and then apply it. The reason that this one works well is because as soon as the app is launched into the actual UI then everything has been fetched and the remote config values has been updated. And the one downfall here is that this option will extend the time that the user has to wait before they can use the app. The third option which is also a popular one is to load the values for the next time the user uses the app. With this implementation, you apply the values that was fetched in the previous session, if any was fetched, and then you kick off another fetch call that you won't react to when it's complete. Since the application of the values is almost instant, your app will always start up with the values that was previously fetched. This works well if you also have to download some additional data for the next startup. Since we already have our startup logic set up, we will be using the second option where we show a loading indicator while fetching the remote config data. Head over to foldstacks.com and open up the remote config tutorial. Since this is in a series, we've already built quite a lot of the app that we are using. So in this tutorial, we'll use the code from the previous dynamic link tutorial to start our application. You can download the code from the written tutorial. Now that we've passed through the theory, we can start off by adding a remote config value into our Firebase project and then using that in the code. 
Head over to the Firebase console and open your project and on the left you can go down to the remote config option. When it opens up you'll see the add parameter box with no config added yet. We'll start off by adding the parameter key which we'll set to show underscore main underscore banner. The default value for this parameter will be false. And as you know, the main functionality for remote config is to add conditional parameters. Click on the add value for condition drop down and select define new condition. Then we'll give it a name and we'll set it to banner on Android only. Now you can click on the applies drop down and you'll see multiple access for when this value can be set. You can set it at a specific time. You can use the user property and it will get the value that you set through the analytics. You can use countries, platforms, regions. And what we will do at this point is just choose the platform option and set it to Android. What this means for us is that the value that we are entering now will only be this value on Android devices. We'll set the value to true and then we'll click on the add parameter button. This will now show you a neat little overview of when the value will be true or false. Then in the top right corner you can click on publish changes and then you can publish your remote config. Now once again this doesn't mean that all of your apps will immediately start using this value. If the cache hasn't expired your app will only get the value once that cache has expired. You can head over to the code that you downloaded or into your own project and then we'll add the Firebase remote config package. We'll use version 0.3.0 plus 3. Then you can open up the services folder and create a new file called remote config service. And inside this file you can create a new class called remote config service. The first thing we'll do is keep a private reference to remote config in a variable called remote config. We'll be using the singleton pattern for the remote config service so we'll create a constructor that takes in the remote config instance. And then for this constructor we will set the private remote config value equal to the remote config passed in through the constructor. Then we'll add a static reference to the remote config service called instance. Then we can set up the static get instance function which will return a future of type remote config service. For the body of this function we will simply check if the instance is equal to null and if it is we will construct a new instance of the remote config service and we'll pass in the remote config value using the static instance property on the remote config class. This instance property returns a future of type remote config so we have to wait on that instance value. And at the end of this function we will return the remote config service instance. Now we can head over to the locator file where we can register our remote config service singleton. We'll create a new variable called remote config service. The value of this variable will be set to the value returned from the get instance function on the remote config service. Since we have to wait on that value, we have to change the setup locator function to return a future and mark it as a sync. Once that value has been retrieved, we want to register it with the locator as a singleton. Now because the setup locator function has become a future, we have to go into the main file and we have to make sure that our main function returns a future of type void as well. Then we can mark it as a sync and we can await on the setup locator call. Now that all the setup is done, we can move on to the actual remote config functionality. We'll start off by creating a constant string that will store the key that we'll use to reference the remote config values. We'll set this key value equal to the same value that we typed into the console called show main banner. Then to make things easier for ourselves, we'll create a boolean property on the remote config service called show main banner. This property will return the remote config dot get bool value and we'll pass in the key that we just created. Then we can move on to the actual initialization logic. We'll create a new function that returns a future called initialize. And in this function we will start off by creating a try catch statement. The first thing if you remember is to set the default values. We do this by calling the set defaults and passing in a map of type string key and value dynamic. So at the top of our remote config service we'll create a new final variable called defaults of type string key and value dynamic. The first and only value in here will be the show main banner key and the default value will be set to false. The next thing we'll do is to fetch and activate the values. We'll do this through a function that returns a future called fetch and activate. 
Then below the initialize function, we'll create a new function called fetch and activate that returns a type future. The first thing we'll do in this function is to call the fetch function on the remote config instance. And the second thing we'll do, which you can probably guess, is to call the activate fetched function on the remote config instance. Now, if you remember correctly, I mentioned that there's a throttling scenario that can happen if you are fetching your values with an expiration value where the duration is set to zero. This is a way to force your app to get the current values on the server, but it can also cause a lot of throttling issues given that the solution is not meant to be real time or hammered with multiple requests. But if you do happen to use the duration zero at some point, you'll have to catch the fetched throttle exception so that you can know that that's the reason why you didn't get your remote config values. So for the try catch, we'll catch specifically the fetched throttle exception and then we'll print out the remote config fetched was throttled and we'll also add a general exception catch where we'll just print out that the remote values couldn't be fetched at this time you shouldn't be using the print statements directly because it's not as informative as using something like the logger which i'll link in the top right corner now this is a great place to use the warning logs so that you can see that something went wrong but it's not a fatal error that could cause your app not to work. Then we can go ahead and go call the initialize function where it will be used. Head over to the startup view model. At the top of the startup view model, we can now locate our remote config service using the locator and passing in the type remote config service. And then directly after handling our dynamic links, we can now call the initialize function on the remote config service. Just as a quick note, as you see, we are doing service location and we are not doing dependency injection. I have actually asked the devs from Fullstacks and I've been putting time aside where I will be reviewing the current architecture and adding some additional things and one of those things will be to use actual dependency injection in the architecture because I think because of the new code generation packages it will allow us to be more efficient in the long term. We've currently built about six applications using the current architecture and it works very very well. There are still some things that can improve in the architecture like with all of them so in the next series i will be sharing the new way that i'll be doing stuff using the same architecture but with some slight modifications if you have anything that you are struggling with in the architecture personally please leave a comment below of what that is and how i can address it we are doing a full review of six production code bases so i'm very excited to share the findings in the next series with you guys Please remember to subscribe so that you can see the architecture course that I'll be releasing soon. The last thing we want to do is add this value into the base model. The reason for that is that it's very similar to the current user value where it will probably most likely be used in 50% if not more of the views. And because this app is so small, it is being used in 50% of the views only. To add this into the base model, we will locate the remote config service and then we'll expose a new boolean property called show main banner which indexes into the remote config service and returns the show main banner value then you can head over to the home view where we'll add the ui and as you know by now i'm not a fan of showing how to build ui so we'll quickly go over what's being added as i show you the code that's being added this will be a white container with drop shadow and some text in the middle. The most important thing I want to show is the if statement, which will make sure that this container only shows if the main banner value is true. This will be a container of height 80 and we'll set the width to double dot infinity to make sure it stretches the full width of the screen regardless of the children. Then we'll also set the margins of the container. We'll set the vertical value to 15. Then I'll just copy the box decoration from the written tutorial where we give it a box shadow, a color and a border radius of 10. We'll set the alignment of this container to center and the child of this container will be text with the value compound can now share songs directly from play music. And the final thing is to set the text alignment to center. The last and final thing to do is to call the ensure initialized for the widgets binding. So since the service locator makes use of the remote config instance before the app has been initialized properly, we have to ensure that the plugin bindings are set up properly. To do that in Flutter, we will call the widgets flutter binding class and call ensure initialized on that flutter 
class. This will make sure that the plugins can be used by the time we get to the setup locator function. And if you run the code now, you'll see at the top that it says Compound can now share songs directly from the Play Music. That is the banner that we just added. I'd also like to show you how this works. If we change this value to false and we, we update and publish those changes, when you go back to the app and you run the code from the beginning, the banner should still be showing since the default expiration for the cache is 12 hours. And as you see, when it starts up, the banner is still showing at the top of the view. Now, if you want the fetch function call to get the values from the remote config server, you can set the expiration to zero seconds. You can't do this all the time because you'll get a throttling exception like I explained earlier. But just to show you that this works, we'll run the code and you should see the banner disappearing at the top of the screen. To make smarter use of this forced remote fetch, you can pass in an optional value called fetch from server. And when this value is set to true, you can set your expiration equal to zero. Or if it's not, you can leave it as the default expiration, which is 12 hours. If your app is not being used continuously every day, it's most likely that the second time that the user uses the app, which would be the next day, your app will have the new values and it should be fine given that it expires within 12 hours. But that's all from remote config. I personally don't use the service, but I didn't want to leave the Firebase course without covering the remote config functionality. When we start using this more frequently in our production apps, I will have a lot more to share on this topic, but at the moment that's all that we're going to cover. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and I'll see you guys next week.